Just before uh, opening the, the response to um, a dialogue with the floor, um, it would just, it's, it's kind of interesting, I think, to, um, in my mind, throw this uh, question of um, the manifesto or the unbuilt kind of project of urbanism um, and set it in a cyclic way against the, um, actually, those, those projects that have become a reality. Uh, I think it's, in, in, it's extremely interesting. It, it, here at the AA, in the light, late 70s, um, it, was, it was true that there was actually no building going on, but there was a huge amount of thinking. And I, I for one, was a, a student here at a point when a lot of the protagonists around the table or those who uh, influenced them uh, were teaching right here. And it was, it, this was a hotbed. It was, uh, you know, Alvin's obsession was the city. And uh, coming out of that was the choice of a series of, uh, of phenomenal teachers, clearly. You know, Bram, obviously, uh, Zaha, Ilya Zengelis. Um, uh, the, the whole world of Percy Street, which isn't, talked about so much now, and act kind of uh, the, the world of Brian Anson and uh, uh, Hans Harms and, and so on. A very broad range, Dalibor Vesely, um, a very broad range of very different positions in terms of the, ci the city. It was absolutely about the manifesto. Um, and I always think that actually it takes about two decades for that, that idea of the studio as a place of research to manifest itself. And if I look at the work of, of, uh, of the, um, the architects involved tonight and others, you know, it's very true that those programs, those experimental programs, are the programs are in a kind of uh, way that, uh, that keep going um, in, a, in, in, a, in a, a forceful and interesting uh, way. So uh, in a way, I would like to just open uh, the question. It seems extremely interesting uh, with this sort of sense of frustration. Um, and, and actually, a, a, you know, something that is, um, is clear in a, a lot of the projects you showed, a sort of, uh, a kind of utopianism, actually, um, you know, in terms of their, 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 uh, their <coughs> can I say, uh, isolation. I, it's the most overt in the desert. Um, you know, as opposed to the grittiness of London, um, which uh, raises another issue that I hope we can discuss of, of simultaneity. Um, Milan, you know, I don't know Milan as well, but looking at the images and the theme, there is a, a kind of, uh, of a persistent uh, sense of uh, somehow classical order working between uh, the, uh, the classical city and the condition of nature, which pervades this, um, this proposition, which I find absolutely fascinating. It's a kind of singular uh, er entity in a way, as opposed to um, the the uh, condition we have in London, which is so much um, not just London, but a city of many cities that are in total opposition. Um, it, they, each of these places, you look at that plan of, uh, of uh, 19th century King's Cross, and you see the, there are a series of sort of uh, potentials like uh, pearls that are uh, are bred out of difference. It, whether it's the city of London, Canary Wharf, whether it's the city of Westminster, and the city, where to be an architect in this place, you actually need a passport to, to work, you know, between the two. The, the cultures are so different. Um, so the Milan uh, context, and the London context, and the world context that Renier's uh, kind of uh, working in seem to me extremely interesting. I wonder if within that there are some <laughs> responses. <laughs> Uh, which, which, uh, can you repeat the second phrase? <laughs> <laughs> can, I see, what, can I see one thing? No. I, I have a response, actually. Um, okay, I'd say it. The, uh, I, I think it's very important uh, that none of the projects I, even though I might present them as utopias now, uh, started out as utopias. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them are, if you look, 2005, 2006, 2007, is in, in a world that was not hit by the financial crisis yet. A world where, strangely enough, in certain parts of the world, the level of exuberance that the financial system created uh, bordered on, on utopianism, but there was a very poisonous divide there in, in the sense that if you look at what goes on in Dubai, it's an aberration. 
But it's strangely today, in, in, in a very strict regimented market economy, it is often aberrations that can breed a strange kind of small angle for utopianism to reappear. Um, there is a particular anecdote that uh, people built a tower, uh, the Sheikh of Dubai embarked on a tower of a thousand meters and one meter high, which had a gross net ratio of I think 43%. I mean, this would make Stuart Lipton <laughs> extremely happy. Um, <coughs> that thing nevertheless was built because simply there was a macroeconomic relevance to it that the fact if it was built it was a spectacle, it would attract more tourists, they would fly Emirates, they would stay in Emirates Hotel, they would visit uh, a country and simply a macroeconomic consideration came into play uh, which made that thing feasible and of course this happens in in a context of totalitarianism, at least where the state owns 51% of the shares in all those companies. But it's also strangely reminiscent of a strong public sector in the West that at one point used to instill much more idealism in, 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 in building altogether. So strangely enough, for us it was a very strange neck and neck race mm -hmm. between the clear evil uh, that, that is present in those places and on the other hand the very tempting um, fertile ground mania that idealism mm. requires. But I mean, all the projects I've shown were, were real, uh, even mm. White City. Mm. No. Mm. No. Yeah. Can I say something? One thing. Please. Yeah. No, just to create gap and continuity at the same time. Uh, with, with Rainier, actually, we did an exhibition which is now open in the Maxi, which is called Recycle. And the uh, opening essay that I, I mean, the, pay, the text that I wrote for it's called per una architettura non edificante, for an unbuilding architecture. So mm. the discussion is still open, of course. But, what we, but our utopia in that case is to look for an unbuilt architecture, which is also building. I mean, mm. the, the contradiction is the, the limp we, we're looking for. The second point, I think, which is my typical fight with PV, no? uh, there can't be architecture utopia without I mean, social utopia. I mean, the, the architect, uh, utopia has a certain amount of poison, as Rainier was saying. That poison become, becomes 100% uh, when utopia is, is, is the form of utopia versus the sense and the political and the social and the anthropological presence of utopia in society. And of course, Dubai and, and the Emirates are exactly the, but not only, I think, the, the, the exact uh, Corto, corto circuit, how do you say that in English? I mean, the, the exact track of this. Yeah. May I? Please, just, Graham, yeah. Well, um, I, I, I was very interested in the, the presentations. I mean, it, it, it is interesting that, um, in theory, we're all doing the same thing, uh, but actually doing it in a very, very different way. And um, I, I was fascinated uh, by Rainier's red lines through his, um, uh, yeah. his, his failed propositions. And I, I kept asking myself for the rest of his talk, well, why, why, why was that? There must have been a reason for it. You know, it can't, it's, uh, and and it's, it's interesting that you, you turned it into an art exhibition and sort of celebrated it. But actually, you probably need to spend as much time thinking through that, that maybe there were things that people didn't want actually to do. And I mean, I don't mean that cru cruelly. It's just I think that there probably is a, a difficulty when you're involved in a world of um, creative speculation. Um, and uh, that I mean, Rainier's analysis is, is, <coughs> is terribly interesting and very thorough and incredibly clear. But, but I worry sometimes that, that, that um, it produces a way of thinking about things that is maybe self-referring um, and somewhat hermetic to itself. Now, you, you can respond I, to this, but, yeah. but, I, but I, I do think that master plans yeah. and thinking about the city, when, when you put the pebble in the water, actually you have to think about where all the ripples go way beyond the little diagram you're drawing in the first place. Before we get the response, can I turn to Michele and you know this question of uh, of the proposition of 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 
immense density in your towers, your bio towers, the verticali, yeah. um, on the one hand, and um, and then the the question of that kind of community of of the wooden house, as it were. Um, I, I'm just interested in, in the bit between and how that uh, how that section within the city uh, and that incredibly evocative uh, collage image of uh, Milan set between mountains and plains um, and forestation uh, would work. Can, uh, can we um, can we turn to that as a, as actually a between uh, a world between? I mean, it's clearly being manifested. It's uh, it's been it's being it's been embraced. Uh, politically and culturally, um, and the images I think were being very, very interesting. So it's uh, interesting to see uh, between the failure, I think the, f the, the heroic failures, which are about uh, exploration, um, actually, you know, and the seeds of the future, um, and the world between, and actually the what London seems to have, um, which is a series of implemented um, uh, propositions, which are you know. To, be, to debate as well, but yeah. no, maybe well for who doesn't know Milano is a r really a fragmented city, but uh, you have to think that is a small city if you take uh, only the the Milano uh, as you know from the map uh, that is a uh, two million less than two million person, but uh, the system of the city is a seven eight million person and is really connected and. Uh, the project you have seen uh, are located mainly in the in the center, in the body of the city, because uh, is the, the the place uh, which in this period has a, uh, a big uh, crisis uh, of identity on the, his development, because like in every city in Italy, people are living in the center for going to live uh, in the surrounding in uh, small uh, villas with garden, and uh, this is uh, happening also in Rome. This is happening in all uh, the main Italian cities. And uh, so there is this uh, uh, eating of agricultural land uh, and the growing of city that is creating this uh, uh, big uh, pianura padana like an uh, infinitive city and so on. We have many book and re research about this. But what is important is about uh, the identity, because uh, if Milano think that uh, uh, is the capital of the fashion and of the design, and uh, is uh, thinking to organize a Salone del Mobile, and uh, uh, this uh, process will not stop. And this process will maintain uh, some part of the city really uh, strong, uh, Salone del Mobile, Tortone, and, uh, but uh, the, this process of uh, uh, diffusing uh, and uh, everything will, uh, will erode the identity of the city like in the last 20 years happened. And uh, Expo is the occasion, and from this point of view I connect uh, to the uh, Mario Monti <laughs> choice <laughs> to, 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 to say stop, stop Olympics, <laughs> stop Olympics. <laughs> and uh, uh, if a Expo that is an ephemeral event, uh, like all big events are ephemeral, is used by Milan uh, in a smart way to rethink his identity, that is his true identity, to be a capital of a huge uh, area that is Pianura Padana, that is made with a strong uh, economy based also on uh, agriculture with, uh, uh, I, I mean, is uh, really connected to his territory and uh, the expo is the occasion to restart uh, his, uh, I don't know, for example, there is all the network of channels designed by Leonardo da Vinci that nobody know in Milano and the expo can be an occasion to reopen this uh, water system, and this is part of the identity of the city. If um, the future of Milano is a uh, thing that is uh, only related to the global market uh, and uh, all of this uh, um, uh, economical system that now is in crisis and uh, we know uh, we have a, a really a weak uh, Mm, architecture, strategy on the city, and uh, is the same strategy of the l last uh, 20 years. So this is a, a, um, a, uh, a thesis about uh, self-sufficiency and localismo at a kind of 
No. A larger scale? It will never be. No. <laughs> it's I don't it think. It cannot uh, be self-sufficiency in no yeah. city. And it's, Italy it's loses 10, uh, yeah. last, this last year, Italy lost 10% of agricultural land and not around the city in the agricultural land. In so the agricultural. It's, it's ideological. But can I try to post this in a way that mm -hmm. everybody can understand? I think uh, I, th I see two. Uh, I see two possibilities. Allies and Morrison are exploiting in a po in the best postmodern, post post postmodern, uh, not nostalgic way, the 20th century architect, architect basically, and the 20th century approach to urban design to host and to adapt to the 21st century world, you know, which is a world of city which grow in a different way that Ricky could tell much better than me. So it's, it's a traditional approach to urban design, studying the way to make it possible and make it usable, flexible to the new conditions of cities. Uh, Stefan's approach or, or Paolo's, which, which you didn't see, uh, approach is to uh, forget that possibility of urban design and try to find different different approaches. I mean, the la landscape, urbanism, archaeology, super buildings, whatever, uh, which is kind of forgetting the role of the architect as it was in the 20th century and the role of urban design, architect as urban design that it was in the 20th century. But this is very open because maybe this 21st century architect does not even exist. No, maybe that's the only possible way. I've seen, and actually I hosted a lecture by Charles, Val Charles Valdine three weeks ago at the museum. And he started with this beautiful project in which uh, uh, the landscape was taking the place of urbanism and regenerating cities. But then the last project he showed, and I, and I must say there must be also somebody from this school involved in those projects in Hong Kong or whatever. Landscape urban was kind of 200 high-rise buildings with a beautiful uh, garden-like design landscape at the base of it, so what, what the hell? Uh, so I think th this is interesting to see. I mean, is it, is it, can we face uh, and be part of the transformation of cities uh, using the tools that you have so beautifully and so perfectly I mean, they spoke of what happens after the Olympics, which is in your case did not happen. Uh, or we have to look for a completely different <coughs> demiurgo, no? for a di completely different post-technician role for the architects, which is uh, restarting the discipline from a kind of a tabula rasa. I think this is the open question, and I have no answer for this. There's a response, and then, and, then, and then there are so many um, uh, you know, uh, parties in the audience who I'm sure have a lot to say. We'll cast it open. Please, yeah, uh, circling back to, to you, um, I think you said 25% wasn't bad. Uh, <laughs> no, no, so 25% uh, no. we, we, we realize we're generally uh, not necessarily an unsuccessful uh, practice, I would say. Um, I would like to get away from the kind of common misunderstanding that this talk generally provokes, is that I'm complaining yeah. uh, about unrealized work. No, I'm not, it's we it's have celebrated. Well, yeah. well, no, well, I'm not even yeah. celebrating. I think that's another misconception, but maybe that goes to, but anyway. Um, I also realize, I mean, that talking about failure in the Italian context provokes entirely different connotations than talking about failure uh, here, uh, because I mean, there is a kind of pathos and pride to failure in Italy that there is not uh, necessarily in other countries. But really, and, and also the reasons why the projects didn't happen are generally quite clear. Most of these are pre-financial crises. The, the stuff in Dubai, they started building, uh, and, and then they went bankrupt. So there are, one doesn't need to dwell uh, on many of the reasons. Uh, the BBC went bankrupt in a different way, didn't develop their assets. So there are very pragmatic reasons. But I want to discuss these projects not necessarily as OMA projects, but as actually a reality in the life of every architect, a suppressed reality in, of everybody that talks about their eternal successes when there is an abundant majority of things that do not happen. And in a way, precisely presenting the projects is a way I mean, the lecture is much longer. It goes into the reason it goes in, in what happened. is actually to talk about practice rather than uh, projects uh, per se. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is, if anything, a kind of forensic record, uh, a 
kind of big brother um, of, of, of what, what your life as a practitioner is like. Okay. Come on. Um, <coughs> to the floor. Yeah. Right here. Are there any questions from the floor? No. Then I, I would like to uh, intervene and, and maybe uh, try to see how some of the discussions that are currently taking place within the school can relate to uh, the discussion here. You know, we in the school, of course, are dealing with a master plan. And the master plan is about enlarging the institution to uh, occupy the entire side of Bedford Square. And this has provoked a lot of discussions that are, of course, relating to the architecture uh, side, but mainly have a connotation on the governance of the institution once it will acquire. It's not, of course, an urban regeneration uh, master plan. It's an institutional master plan. And, but my question is uh, leading exactly towards the governance side. And, and it uh, may be, uh, is more directed to Rainier, because I think that your provocation to consider the two sides of the uh, practices you know, as uh, equally important and probably even uh, more important to learn from the disadvantages uh, of the unsuccessful realization. How uh, do you consider the master planning uh, conditions that uh, are being uh, proposed tonight as attempts to um, somehow negotiate the practice of architecture vis-a-vis -vis other practices? What are the conditions of, not say the architect vis-a-vis -vis the engineer or vis-a-vis -vis the politician, but as a practice, you know, as a possibility of organizing and trying to control those urban uh, mainstream and almost uh, maelstrom that uh, is changing our world today. How do you understand the failure as possibilities of negotiation with other practices, Rainier? Mm. I'm not sure I understand your question, but I will try to answer the question that I think you are asking. Uh, so forgive me if it goes pear-shaped. Um, I think... Um, more than 50% of the world's population lives in cities. That's rapidly becoming more and more and more. Cities are becoming much larger entities. Today there are cities whose GDP surpasses that of entire countries. Uh, uh, at the strange, uh, in a strange way, the governance and the status of those who govern city hasn't quite reached a par with their numerical size. I think what we are seeing is that uh, probably very, very large cities who hold so much resource, so much kind of concentrations of money uh, to there will see a kind of an emancipation on a political uh, sense that maybe remaining governmental entities will either be supranational or be more <coughs> local. Uh, and, and therefore, I think we will see a politics of abstract legislation, like you see. Uh, it's not very popular here, but I mean in Brussels and in the European Union. And at the same time, we will see a more local type of politics, which is more realistic, which wills, deals differently with matters like immigration, because they know what they're talking about when they talk about immigration, which deal with pragmatic problems with the cities, which are also probably a type of politics which are more entrepreneurial uh, when it comes to development. And I think what will happen if this trend continues that to some extent I think we will see in the long run a kind of merger between urbanism and city governance as a single discipline, that it almost makes no sense to propose them. And in that sense I agree with you because I mean I think essentially the shortcoming of our master plans is that they are probably, despite their size, too much embedded in the classical sense of our uh, uh, discipline. And I think we will see a kind of merger between uh, uh, urbanism and politics, and I think somebody like Stefano Bueri actually personifies uh, that. I mean, there is less flattering different examples of architects who went into politics, but, uh, uh, but clearly I think that there's a typology. I mean, I think the metabolists uh, had a character amongst them that also be deliberately became a bureaucrat in a way to pave the way for their idealism and to give it a kind of political 
landing. So I think that is something that, that we will see happening. And in that sense, also the teaching of urbanisms in school uh, will, will change as a result. Uh, was that the question you asked? No, the question is, vis-a-vis -vis what you just said, how do you uh, perceive the negotiation of the uh, practice of architecture? How do you perceive that architecture will negotiate it? So what is, in other words, what is architecture ready to give up in order to encounter uh, that newly mm. established condition of m uh, approximation between governance, or right. I would even say governmentality on mm. the city, and the uh, new task that we have to face. Well, well my, my plea was actually... Third, a, yeah, uh, no, no, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, my plea was that actually it was the contrary, that architecture doesn't give up something, that architecture aggressively reclaims mm -hmm. uh, something. And you know, the nice thing about a merger is that you no longer <coughs> have to negotiate because you'll be negotiating with yourself, which is hermetic, admittedly, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah but I see, I mean, I, mean, I see what uh, John is asking is, I mean, in, in, in certain conditions, the market is asking the architects to give up one soul of his puzzle, which is being not only the representative of the client and of the beauty, but also of the social good, of the common good. No, it's common good the title for your friends. Uh, Biennale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Common, uh, ground. So common ground. Common ground. Common ground. Yeah. But, the common, but in that case, it's the common good. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's what <laughs> late capitalism is yeah. asking. The architect can react in the way when you're there, reclaiming even more or giving it up and, and becoming, uh, you know, like the engineer or the, the another professional, which is simply the mean to make happen what things desires. May, may I yeah. what just, people desire. just add something to that? It's, it's, uh, I, I really worry about the imagery of master planning. And I, I, th I think that um, uh, there was a word that was, was constantly used, which was utopian. And the difficulty um, I have with that is not, it's not that it's it's bad to dream and think of how things could be, because of course if you don't do that you don't get anywhere. But um, with any uh, complex institution, be it a city or indeed the Architectural Association, um, um, I, I've never ever seen a master plan anywhere ending up the way it was originally thought out at the beginning. And, and master plans for us are ways of beginning and getting going so you generate momentum within a general direction. And I think one of the difficulties when the imagery is so complete, in, in fact it can put the fear of God into people because you simply don't think you'll ever have the resources to do that. And, and you'll also, by joining it, in fact you become a non-participant rather than a participant. And with your, I, don't, I know nothing about this school of architecture, I mean I rarely come I walk past it a lot, and um, <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't go to this school. But, um, uh, but, but I, I do understand its political governance to be intensely complicated, and, and you know, so, some very strong-minded people. And if you don't have a plan that, that takes into account the, str the strength of those minds and the involvement of those people, and the fact that it'll get pushed and shoved and changed and influenced, just like this great building has done, the way it's just accommodated change over the many decades it's been in existence, then you will be self-defeating when you start. Do we have uh, yeah. intervention from students uh, on this take? About Milan and um, specifically about the towers in relation to the greater project. When I, it happens to be the city in which I live in, and every now and then I cross the area and <laughs> Don't you think that the towers, mainly ex extracted from the larger context in which they were supposed to, um, in which they were supposed to belong to, generally, don't you think there is a risk of a mis misinterpretation, and it passes off as being just one of the multiple elements which actually already occur within the city, as yeah, totally. enormous distorted glass towers and or there, circular? There. Follies in the middle of nowhere, yeah, which we are actually seeing that happens. I'm always uncertain whether I should consider it as an obelisk of a kind of an unrealized uh, overall plan of the whole city, or whether it's just one of one of the many. 
And perhaps stressing on this, I would say, almost um, cliche of bio, even more one of the many. Yeah. I think the misunderstanding is uh, easy. But in that case, uh, that tower born because uh, there was a huge uh, um, building, uh, not a really high residential of a four floor occupying a big piece of that uh, area that is going to be transformed really fast. And there were just a uh, uh, tower of offices and uh, all uh, the residential uh, that were occupying the ground. So our proposal was uh, simply just to maintain uh, uh, that uh, market level of housing, uh, to maintain the quality of a singular villa on a garden, and uh, not uh, to consume a lot of ground, but uh, to pull one on each other. <coughs> and so the concept of that building grew because of this, not uh, because uh, uh, an advertising company were asking to create uh, something. But finally, I agree with you that uh, it became a, uh, an iconic building that is used uh, for uh, doing the Christmas uh, uh, greetings uh, from from the people, but uh, in detail, that building that is going to be built that you have seen uh, use the, 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 the density that is necessary in um, the center of a city like Milano to open a public part uh, in a critical area that is, very, um, that is the center of a strong debate uh, of people who are saying uh, you are building uh, and not leaving uh, anything public. So there will be a uh, the park that is going to be designed by Inside Outside and uh, has a beautiful name, La Biblioteca degli Alberi, the Bibliotech of the, of the trees, the library trees, and is a public garden. And uh, so maybe is, uh, uh, in that case, uh, is not so rhetoric project, uh, also if it's the most iconic. I want just to add something to the master plan discussion uh, that is one uh, element that uh, in the 70s, I think, when was presented the master plan of New York, uh, the Black Panthers were uh, fighting against the master's plan, not the master plan, the masters, in terms of masters. And so to, 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 to add something to, the, uh, to your question, uh, the, the result uh, of the work of the architect uh, starts the negotiation and uh, it's not is really difficult to have a negotiation before between the architect and the politician and uh, the, uh, the market power before uh, something and this uh, something in, in is the master plan so it's the starting point of the discussion mm, in many cases uh, like uh, uh, in big events uh, or in other occasions but, but any negotiation needs an opening position. Uh, and, and I am all for negotiation, unless negotiation becomes a kind of a, a pretext to abandon an opening position altogether, because then you get, and, and uh, by the way, I didn't know this, but was the objection of the Black Panthers against the word master in the word master plan and thereby implicitly making a notation to slavery, yeah. mm. uh, then uh, I think we should invent a different word altogether. Insensitive sort of oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of mm -hmm. concept. Well, I, I would suggest the word guide a plan. Because so uh, what? Uh, guide a plan. Guide a because plan. a guide. A guide, yeah. yeah. Sounds yeah. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with it? Guide is a guide plan. A guide. It guides. Mm. Better than master because master plan implies that it really does have mastery over everything that will happen afterwards. Mm. The guider will, uh, will merely guide what comes after. Mm. But the question I want to ask is how is it possible to approach uh, these issues purely from the side of designers when in fact obviously it's the clients who offer the opportunities for master planning or urban design or civic design or indeed just planning because until somebody comes along and offers a parcel of land which is so big that it requires something like a master plan or a guided plan and that contains several blocks uh, rather than just one building uh, then there's no opportunity now the question is then who 
who is generating the authority to uh, commission such large projects. Mm. Uh, it's a point that R Rem Kulaz raises in Delirious New York where he points out that uh, Rockefeller Center was the only uh, landlord in effect that owned one more than one block mm -hmm. in Manhattan and therefore you had to have some kind of urban vision because you were facing across several streets. But uh, if nobody's got the sufficient authority, uh, let alone the money, to license these things and commission them, then uh, where is the architect? I, I think it's an interesting point you raise. Um, it's, 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 it's very interesting that increasingly in the free market economy, the public sector, in order to get any of its ideals uh, realized, has to rely on the initiative taken by the private sector. Um, in the case of White City, uh, that single master plan involved six different landowners who all had a small parcel in the city, which was all too small to, in a way, realize the ambitions that the GLA uh, had set out. So they came together uh, very deliberately in a consortium of landowners to have a large enough track of land, uh, in a way, uh, to create a kind of credible development. They also did that, not entirely out of idealism, but they realized that only once the, the track of land was big enough that they could, in a credible way, live up to the ambitions as they were verbalized uh, by the city. And then, of course, a very complex process of negotiation ensues uh, in a sense that uh, the city doesn't have the land, uh, but in a way has set the condition that it would like to be met before it grants planning permission. Uh, the owners of the land want planning permission, preferably with meeting as few of those conditions as they possibly can, because they're not generally revenue generating. And that's when a, and that's when a very, very long process of negotiation of kind of chess uh, ensues that eventually may or may not lead uh, to a master plan. One, one witness yes. thing. In, in the 70s, my masters, my masters, bro, uh, they, had a, they had a very clear answer to this. If a mayor goes to Aldo Rossi or Giorgio Crazzi and he asks for a slaughterhouse, a school, they would design a library. Not because they were interested <laughs> in library and theater. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever the commission was, they would build a library. <laughs> and they built it. And the library is there in, in a, it was never even open. And it's there as a ruin today. There's so many ruins of this kind in Italy. Uh, this is auto autonomia, mm -hmm. no? we, what mm -hmm. we're becoming nostalgic now, mm -hmm. and what I do not want to become mm -hmm. nostalgic uh, about. So first thing not to do, I think, is this in design terms and in, in architecture terms. Let, let's find another way, please. If one just uh, judges what master planning is about on the basis of the presentations, perhaps not on the ensuing conversation, it, it's quite difficult to join the dots, I have to say, just listening to the way you, you three were speaking. Except for one conclusion, I nearly get the impression you just don't like doing it. <laughs> I mean, that, I, it, it's rare that you sit in a room with people like yourselves. And there, there isn't a sort of enthusiasm and excitement. Very rare, I mean, in yeah. this room at the AA. And so I, I'm, it's a straight question. I mean, it's a, it's a tough one to do. And, um, and taking up Brian's point, I was also struck how, you know, every you have little time to talk about things, how little different, well, you hardly mentioned which master plan was uh, um, effectively commissioned by whom, right? Because I think, you know, the, the point made there makes an enormous difference. Yeah. Except for one thing, which uh, just reflecting what you presented and bringing it back a little bit to the architectural thing is the issue of scale. I mean, if I were to be totally cynical and say, well, actually, what brings these schemes together, with the exception, I think, of perhaps the Boyer Studio ones, because you very much looked at the vegetable patches, right, <laughs> is bigness. I mean, I was struck by the bigness of the blocks mm -hmm. that emerged n nearly anywhere that you were all working, right? Which, uh, taking a sort of critical position, don't make cities. <coughs> they make something else, and they make pieces of real estate. And I'm just wondering whether, tell us, do you love doing your job when it comes to master planning? <laughs> uh, if not, why not? Uh, and is, is there a sort of another scale? Because what is actually happening, given Rainier's very clear point about 
massive amount of urbanization and more and more money going to the cities, particularly in, in the neo-capitalist worlds of Asia, et cetera. The requirement now is for McKinsey, to, for McKinsey has done three or four major master plans for Mumbai, vision of the future, et cetera, where they're happily disengaged from issues of scale, texture, and architecture. And they're much easier to deal with than you guys are. So is, there, is, there, is that the way to go? Yeah. How do you, no, I mean, I think that's, that's a big issue, a little yeah, bit of yeah, the yeah, elephant yeah. in the room. But mm. Do you like doing your job? Yeah, I, I do, but I'm not, sure, I'm not sure McKinsey does, actually. I think... Uh, they more. Yeah, but precisely <laughs> because they like their job less. Uh, I think there might be an inverse correlation uh, between fees and, and love. And, and I... <laughs> I, yeah. I do think that actually what makes us difficult is, pres I like doing master plans. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't talk about it if I didn't. And I, I think, you know, th th that's probably a universal uh, thing. But I think precisely what makes uh, us difficult is, is, is because we like what we do and we have certain views of how things should be done in, in a world that, uh, you know, for most part is actually uh, driven by different performance indicators than the performance indicators we hold high, which is precisely why McKinsey, uh, and I know, I mean, it's not, it's PricewaterhouseCoopers, Jones Lang, LaSalle, McKinsey, they all actually claim our job with an increasing amount of success. And I do think that that is not necessarily that we should stop doing uh, our job, but I, I do think that there has been a certain amount of neglect of context of actually what drives our job on behalf of our own profession and indeed a too great hermeticness. Uh, that has allowed that to happen, and in a way, uh, yeah. the, scale the scale issue. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really. No, I don't. I, I don't, rec don't recognise the comment. At least, not actually, not in any of the presentations. I think, for even the larger mass plans, I think are quite touchy feely uh, in our case. But I, w I would like to go to another point of imagery. Uh, that you mentioned. Um, in uh, a condition where the initiative resides with the private sector to make master plans happen, master plans become an entrepreneurial tool. And that is precisely why a business proposition like McKinsey makes a lot of sense. But actually that weirdly gives a renewed relevance to imagery, almost like the imagery in an advertisement campaign. We now draw cities render cities which actually have to make themselves come true, which have to attract the very inhabitants that will eventually live there. We don't plan necessarily for a demographic necessity. We plan to change, uh, particularly the case of Dubai, is Dubai on the whole is an effort to change demographics rather than to capitalize on them. And there you see, you know, a hundred salespeople for every one uh, engineer. You see renderings precede the technical uh, drawings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is definitely a trend. Uh, that I think we both uh, are partially disgruntled by, but flirt with equally much, because it's strangely, it, in a very, it's a, in a very perverse way, it, it brings back the battle to your home ground, and it's precisely the kind of imagery that McKinsey or Jones Lang LaSalle will never be able to produce. So, uh, in the short run, uh, that is how we get by in that context. Um, I. I have to respond to Ricky, um, because we, we've actually worked on a master plan together, so if, I'd, be, I'd be sorry if you thought that we didn't enjoy what we did, because we really do. I didn't say that, I said you, the way you sound. Mm. Ah. Well, I, I, I yeah, no, okay. So you think, you know, well, I think, I, th I think, I think there might be a... Yeah, it's a general... Yeah. The, the, yeah, well, I th it's, very, it's very interesting. I, I, I think discussing... Discussing buildings is one thing because everybody's very polite about their neighbour. But when you're talking about the, the, the planning of a city, um, actually it, it exposes sort of f fundamental things that you hold dear. And, and I mean, I, I'm happy to admit that, that um, hearing the other approaches, I actually find them terribly interesting. But actually I feel slightly perplexed because you know, it is what we do the right thing. I, I mean, I believe it to be right, and I think I think I think what we do is right, and I certainly I, I certainly like the fact that master plans are not a visual game. I mean, I'm not I'm not accusing you of that actually at all, because I think you understand the politics behind it most more than most. But but it, it's it's a multi-layered uh, 
mechanism, uh, and Ricky, you know more about it than anybody, and, and if, as an architect, if you don't engage with, with, with it to the sense that you've got real traction, that you can influence things and participate, you know that the game is lost. And it's, it's quite hard to, uh, to get passionate about that in a, in a very um, public way, actually, but, but passionate we are, because the, I, I mean, I, I firmly believe that every time you place a building in the city, it's not just that building that should be good, but actually all the buildings around it should feel better. And, and that, that's, that's the sort of microcosmic truth of what master planning is about. You, if, you, if, you're not, if you're not using your influence and your e energy and your intellectual skill <coughs> to make the city better than it is, then it's not worth doing. Well, that's the only purpose that we're involved in it, I think. Good. Um, I see Joseph. Uh, Rick with a uh, since, microphone. So. Since there was talk of negotiation, I was thinking that I was, as I was listening to the presentations, I was looking at Graham's slides and I was thinking, well, there's a lot of greenery in these master plans, but it's all ornamental. And then I looked at the Boeri studio and there was really nothing very urban about it. There was no kind of master plan. The, there was an isolated building, the tower, and there were all these agricultural projects. Somehow, I want a negotiation between the two. Can we not have that? <laughs> we have to work with it together, yeah. We have to work, uh, but we are... <laughs> something. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, I know, it's sure, but uh, I think... Uh, um, are there any other, otherwise, I think, questions? Otherwise, we're going to draw this to... Uh, a conclusion, but uh, concluding remarks and in response to the question of negotiation, which seems to me to be very interesting because we've seen a lot of uh, aerial views of these uh, projects, um, and there is a tendency for the, uh, the buildings to stand alone, um, and it seems to me that urbanism is absolutely, you know, um, uh, a very old-fashioned word. Civic design is about negotiation. Neighbor, neighborliness and kind of the, the um, uh, yeah the uh, the grit that creates um, an urban place um, uh, and density. But well, well, ma in the word master plan, we always thought that there is a public, a public event. You know, master plan is about the life of everybody, not only about the life who's going to live in a building. The impression is that the the 21st century architect has lost an ally. No, we always thought we had an ally in somebody who was representing po polit political life, public opinion, whatever you want. This ally we needed in the negotiation with the client, when the client is private, but also when it's public. I see different, I see different answers. I mean, I think in the, in the allies and Morrison answer, this new allies is searched through an intelligent manipulation of the market, of the real estate needs. In, in, in OMA, in Rainier's project, the, 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 uh, the allies is looked for in the aesthetics, probably, of the building. I mean, you, you want to use beauty to convince the people to inhabit a certain kind of stuff. And I see, I mean, a lot of politically correctness in the uh, uh, Milan, uh, answer to this problem. But I think that's our search today, how we can replace the institutional, traditional ally that the architects had in, 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 in the negotiation with the private client, or with the client, with new agents, with new subjects in the society. So I think it's an open discussion with uh, all, of, all of you, all of us as uh, some right are right and wrong at the same time. We are, we are in, in a search, I think. OK. Um, Good. Just uh, again, a thank to uh, the British uh, School in uh, Rome for initiating uh, the uh, exhibition and bringing uh, together and convening uh, this event, which will be shortly available online to the wider audience. This is, of course, part of a uh, tradition and commitment of the Architectural Association to have a public program and public debate as part of the uh, educational 
program uh, in the school. So I would like to ask the students in the room to join me in thanking all our speakers this evening. Thank you.